Mic check, check, check. Welcome to the PowerShell Podcast. Your home for PowerShell and the PowerShell community. The PowerShell Podcast is a PDQ production, making device management simple, secure, and pretty damn quick. And now, here's your host, Andrew Plaw. Welcome to another episode of the PowerShell Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Plaw at Andrew Plaw Tech. And in the next couple episodes, I'm going to be live from PowerShell Saturday in lovely Raleigh, North Carolina, put on by the RTP SUG. Awesome conference. It's been great so far. Currently, I'm halfway through day one, but I'm going to get things started off with one of my favorite talks of the day. Top three talks of the day. I only saw three talks, Uh, but we're joined by Blake Cherry, who gave a presentation on mastering the Redfish protocol, which Redfish is actually super sick. I initially learned about Redfish and Swordfish at PowerShell Summit. Um, there was a really great talk given. I wasn't able to interview the person, Chris, but Blake, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Andrew. And did you check out that talk? I did. And certainly quick shout out to Chris Leonetti that put on a, a great presentation uh, covering the uh, Redfish spec as well as uh, the Swordfish spec, which I'm sure we'll dive into. Yeah, it's pretty sweet. Um, and this is actually your first conference and first time speaking. It is. That is exciting as heck. A pretty good one to go to. I like these smaller, more community-oriented conferences because you really get a chance to talk to people, see the same people throughout the day, and uh, make some good connections there and share some good info. But what is the Redfish Protocol? Yeah, absolutely. So the Redfish Protocol is a a standard that's been uh, published by uh, the Distributed Management Task Force. Uh, So it's an organization that's collected a bunch of different hardware manufacturers, hardware OEMs, and aligned on one single spe- API specification for querying and uh, making changes uh, against BMCs or baseboard management controllers. And what are BMCs? Yeah, so a BMC uh, is effectively a, a separate computer that's integrated into host hardware. So think of it as a Raspberry Pi, effectively, that's co-located on server hardware. Uh, now what that allows you to do is remotely manage uh, the hardware itself so the host hardware you can do things like powering the system on or off Uh, you can open up a a remote vnc terminal to see the console or uh, a number of other different types of administrative actions like a dell idrac sort of thing exactly dell idrac is a implementation or hp has one that they call ilo that's very popular Uh, and most vendors and manufacturers today have their own implementations so this is sort of a way to interact with those in a unified way across different uh, providers which is pretty sick because otherwise I think you'd have to like manually write your own stuff that accommodates for the HP servers that you have, for the Dell stuff you have, all that kind of thing. Is that pretty fair? Exactly. And you can certainly access BMCs uh, through web interfaces. Typically they publish web interfaces that you can access or uh, you can use more legacy protocols, but uh, Redfish is really meant to unify the data model and the schema across all of the different diverse, you know, hardware manufacturers and models uh, so that you can have a consistent set of tools to query and configure these BMCs. So we got Redfish, we got Swordfish. To me, you know, they're both fish. They kind of sit in the same spot in my mind. How can I differentiate the two? Absolutely. So Swordfish is effectively an extension of the original Redfish uh, schema. So the Redfish schema, as it was originally published, uh, supports different aspects of hardware that you can query, configure, etc. Swordfish was built specifically for storage devices. Uh, So published by an organization called SNIA, Uh, it allows you uh, to use the same API, RESTful API interface, uh, but make changes and, and view some of those storage devices. And I like REST APIs. That's kind of, if I'm doing anything in PowerShell, I'm hoping whatever I'm interacting with has some kind of REST API of some sort. So that's promising that that exists. And to me, it's sort of unique because I guess uh, whatever organization you said was able to convince all these providers to get on the same page and conform to a single protocol. And it has pretty widespread adoption. I think you were saying it's even used for supercomputers and all kinds of things. So it seems like the industry has kind of accepted it as something that they're going to be rolling out and supporting. Definitely. And I would say that's a key value proposition of the Redfish standard that all of these manufacturers have gotten on board with adopting the same standard uh, really is of net benefit to the systems administrator, uh, helping make the administration experience more consistent uh, and make your tools and scripts more reusable. Yeah, because so say like for now, all your servers are Dell. That's great. You could write it using something that's a little bit more proprietary maybe. But if you write it using like a Swordfish, 
uh, or a Redfish, you can then switch providers in the future and have a lot of the same scripts and processes that you do kind of carry over. Exactly. And some manufacturers will implement their own bespoke extensions atop of Redfish. So there will be some differences for specific hardware properties or configurations you need to change. But fundamentally, the RESTful API is the same in terms of its core schema. So the tools with some minor modifications can be reused. Yeah. And I think in your presentation, you shared a GitHub repository, which I will provide the link in the show notes if you all want to check that out. But it, it has some good uh, ways of like iterating through. What were some of the functions that you wrote or the scripts that you wrote for that? Yeah, absolutely. So the repository that I covered that I kind of demoed today uh, is really meant to be a, a demonstration of some of the capabilities of Redfish uh, using PowerShell to make the, the API calls. Uh, some of the key functions are uh, collecting hardware inventory across a diverse set of manufacturers and different types of hardware models, uh, which is a, a super helpful function uh, for us and, and what I do for work, as we oftentimes, uh, as a consultant, I work in consulting, enter environments where clients don't have a, a great understanding of their inventory. So they don't have up-to-date asset uh, inventories or uh, very little documentation. So having a generally applicable inventory tool that can collect that information, uh, regardless of the manufacturer of the hardware, is super important for us. So just so I understand, you're a consultant, so you're interacting with people with different environments, and that's how you initially got exposed to this? It is. Uh, certainly, Chris Leonetti's uh, presentation uh, was was another great data point and, and got me interested in learning more about the, the specification. But uh, it's certainly helpful uh, for us when we are working with uh, bare metal hardware or physical hardware. When did you initially discover this and start kind of diving in? It's been a couple months for me, uh, so not a super long time. Uh, but luckily, since it is a simple RESTful API, uh, it's easy to adopt, you know, PowerShell and other uh, scripting languages uh, and apply and build tools using using the API. Which is pretty freaking sick. And I think that uh, in a podcast like this, you know, we're not going to be able to teach everything everyone knows to get up and running. But I hope that we've wet your whistle a little bit and encourage you to explore this further because there is a lot here that you can leverage at work. And I love anything that you can do in the PowerShell space. That's just one of those easy wins. And to me, this seems like one of those where you invest the time, you learn the tool and your current employer will have this available. And from what it sounds like, if you're anywhere that has servers, you're gonna be able to interact with things in this way. And it could be a value add that maybe you put on your resume at the next place you go to. So really cool stuff there. Um, are you seeing other people, like is the community for this growing or, or what's it like out there? Cause I don't have a good sample set. I mean, it's all anecdotal, I guess, for both of us, but are you seeing others are sort of starting to implement this where they work? Yeah, anecdotally, sort of sub subjectively, I haven't seen a lot of uh, people adopting uh, tools or, or building tools to use the Redfish standard, uh, which is interesting to me, considering so many manufacturers have implemented the standard in their products, uh, especially in the last five years or so. Uh, so I think it's a huge opportunity for enhancing uh, the way by which uh, you administer hardware at scale in a data center. And I may, we had a technical issue, so we're having to re-record this a little bit. So I don't know if I've asked this on this recording, the previous one, but how would this differentiate from something like SNMP? Because I know that's a protocol we're all familiar about. We probably learned about some point in our career learnings, but what are the differences there? Sure. So specifically SNMP is, is definitely designed as more of a way to retrieve information. There's not a whole lot of functionality for setting configurations uh, or things of that nature. Uh, there are other protocols, you know, like IPMI that have been longstanding standards uh, implemented by manufacturers. Uh, there are a couple of key issues with those older standards. They were published in the late 90s, so they're, they're certainly dated. They don't support modern authentication methods, token-based authentication, session-based authentication, uh, lack some key encryption features. Uh, so as a way of modernizing uh, a standard for all hardware, Redfish is, meant, is kind of a, a replacement for those uh, different uh, specifications. Yeah, because you're not just querying stuff. You're able to, I think some of the methods you mentioned in the API were like post, put, patch, delete, all those kinds of things. Exactly. So you can, let's take user accounts that are local to that to that BMC. So a local account on iDRAC, for instance, uh, using Redfish, you're able to create new local accounts, view the existing local accounts, change credentials, or even delete local accounts. So kind of a full-fledged uh, API interface for those actions. Which is pretty sweet, especially you mentioned there's modern authentication options there. Could you do something uh, like LDAP authentication or anything like that? 
Yeah, so the standard uh, wholly supports uh, authentication with third party or integrated uh, identity providers. Uh, you would certainly need to configure that identity provider on the BMC before using the protocol. But once you have that configured, you can use those directory accounts. Without something like this, uh, do you think that these interfaces uh, maybe have a lot of stale accounts? Because I can imagine a lot of people go through, they set up the server, maybe they have some problems with it, they inter interact with the uh, BMC a little bit and then kind of set it and forget it. Yeah. Do no, you see that a lot? I definitely do. And I uh, was just having this conversation recently about kind of seeing our clients adopting BMCs, you know, asking the question, are they integrating them with AD or how are they managing credentials? And I think people are kind of all over the place. You kind of see a little bit of everything. Yeah, and this provides a, a pretty helpful way of approaching this. Now, are there libraries available that people can kind of use maybe something in PowerShell or, or other languages that people can kind of use as a starting point? There are there, there are a great number of open source initiatives and libraries that have been published for Redfish. Uh, they are all uh, listed on the uh, DMTF's website where they publish the standard, the Redfish standard. Uh, some of those include uh, libraries for Golang and C, as you mentioned, for Python, uh, as well as a module, an open source PowerShell module that's been published specifically for Swordfish, but it can also be used to query Redfish interfaces. What are the differences there? So it's meant for Swordfish, but you can use it for Redfish. Does that just mean it has like the different endpoints that Redfish maybe uses kind of built in? Yeah, so Swordfish, uh, as we discussed before, is an extension on Redfish. So uh, effectively, the module is communicating with the, the Redfish standard, but it just has some of the extra support for the storage devices and some of the, the extra extensions to the data model so that you can interface with storage appliances and other types of hardware. So what came first, Redfish or Swordfish? Redfish was published first, uh, and then Sword, Swordfish was like published. on top of it. Kind yeah, of thing. yeah. Cool. And what was the organization behind that? Swordfish was published by an organization called SNIA, uh, but they, they do work closely, as to my understanding, with uh, the organization that publishes the Redfish standard to make sure things stay aligned. Yeah, that's pretty sweet. I, I'm still just in shock that this exists. Um, you know, if we hear about different companies that are maybe uh, increasing their prices 80%, maybe in the VM <laughs> space, mm. but to see something like this is kind of promising as someone working in IT. You know, there's, there's hope for you. There's great tools. And if you're using something like PowerShell, uh, taking advantage of stuff like this is a huge bonus. Now, are there any challenges you've kind of run into, like maybe related to uh, locking yourself out or anything like that? <laughs> yeah, no, no, definitely. Uh, to, to your point, uh, when you're working with session-based authentication, you're creating authentication sessions that persist for a certain amount of time, depends on the timeout settings, how long that is. Uh, but in testing, I ran into a few cases where I did lock myself out uh, because I didn't realize I needed to disconnect the session, but uh, that has since been fixed in my in my code repositories. <laughs> I've definitely done that, not with Redfish, but before I've just, oh, I love connecting. I can just connect and connect and connect. And I think it was 365 or something that, that gave me some issues with that. So yeah, good to remember to get rid of that. And uh, what's the title of your presentation? Mastering the, the Redfish protocol uh, with PowerShell. Yes. And did you consider, <laughs> and again, since we had a technical issue, I'm, I'm repeating myself. So I'm making a joke twice, just a heads up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but did you consider a title like One Fish, Two Fish, Redfish is for You Fish? <laughs> Thank you for suggestion. laughing. <laughs> I, I wish I had. I wish I had. Uh, there are some of those open source tools that have come up with creative names. So for instance, there's a PowerShell library called Sushi, obviously a play on the words there with Redfish, uh, but I went with a, a more standard title for this call. So <laughs> let's be real here, people. So I go up to Blake, I'm like, Blake, you wanna do a podcast? I'd love to interview you. He agrees, nice guy. We get here and you know, I put him on the spot and make him laugh at a joke twice, people. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope you can appreciate that. Um, but man, it's been awesome to, to get to meet you and some of the other people here and there's something about in-person events, and I guess this is your first one. So what are your impressions of PowerShell Saturday so far? Yeah, likewise. So far, it's been a great experience. Uh, I think you you hit it on the head earlier in the talk in that it's just a great sense of community, great opportunity to meet peers in similar industries, similar roles, and talk about some of these concepts uh, in the weeds that, uh, that I certainly enjoy as kind of a PowerShell nerd. <laughs> when did you initially get exposed to PowerShell? I've been working with uh, PowerShell uh, for about 10 years at this point, I think my first exposure was when I was working in service desk before I moved to consulting. Uh, 
I was trying to improve our user onboarding workflows. Uh, so kind of saw the potential and the power uh, that learning PowerShell can bring to your uh, sort of sysadmin type responsibilities. And it's a super powerful weapon in my holster, so to say, in consulting, because I'm quickly able to uh, help clients with somewhat complex tasks if you were to work through them through typical user interfaces. Oh, for sure. I think things like consultants, MSPs, like you just have to be using PowerShell. Um, I, you know, maybe there's other tools you could use as well, but like you, you got to, or else you're going to never get anything done. So that's cool. Can you give me a little bit more insight in your background, um, like your career trajectory? I know you're a consultant now, which gives you a lot of exposure, a lot of great opportunities to learn and not only learn, but you're doing like sort of dev work in addition to it. So I, I know you mentioned uh, making some mod modifications to scripts, um, but like what's your career trajectory sort of look like? Sure. So I, I started pretty early working in service desk. So uh, throughout high school and the beginning, first couple of years of college, uh, had opportunities to work in various, you know, help desk, IT support roles that established a, a great foundation, understanding of Windows environments, Active Directory and other sort of key concepts. Uh, after graduating from college, I then went into the consulting industry, uh, which has only served to further bolster my understanding of different technical concepts. Uh, to your point, I do get an opportunity to touch a lot of different types of technologies, a lot of it uh, infrastructure based, but also automation and uh, some, some DevOps concepts, which involve programming. Yeah. And I noticed this is more of a personal question, but how do you manage the two, right? So you are a consultant, you're given a task, you got to fix, you got to implement whatever, but then also you have to like refine your tooling a little bit. How do you carve out that space? How do you visualize that whole process? Yeah, I think something that I, that comes to mind immediately to answer that question is every time I enter an engagement with a client, I think, how can we make this repeatable and how can we build sort of object oriented tools that accept inputs and can deliver on sort of whatever the offering is we're trying to do. And that's brought a lot of opportunities to the firm in that we can deliver projects more quickly. We can do it faster than our competitors uh, because we've written this collection of tools to do a lot of these tasks. And I think I noticed that same kind of vibe in Frank's talk. It's like, we don't want anything hard coded. PowerShell seven could turn into eight. You know, we want to get this dynamically. And I think I saw with a lot of your parameters, you definitely have that mindset of making things adaptable. So that's cool to hear. And I think that's sort of a powershell -y thing. Like if you've been doing PowerShell a while, even if you're at one uh, place, just sysadmin there or whatever you're doing, things change. And if you write things in a way that are adaptable and a little bit dynamic, it is going to serve you well. I think doubly so or triply so in a consultant or MSP type role where you're really going around different environments that could have all kinds of different things. And uh, sounds like Redfish is a good good solution for your world. It, it certainly is. And again, going back to the fact that it's supported by so many different manufacturers uh, really is helpful for making it your tools and scripts more reusable and applicable more broadly. Did you run into any that didn't support Redfish? So I, I did actually. So. I do have a home lab environment with uh, different types of hardware and uh, some of it is a little older. Oh yeah. So <laughs> home lab. So, you know. so anything that, that was built or created pre 2015 is kind of hit or miss on if it has a Redfish implementation. Uh, so you will come across that, but most modern hardware, hardware will support the, the standard. So it was kind of rolled out in 2015. I think you said initially it was more like a white paper and then it was sort of adopted after that. Does that sound about right? Effectively so, yep. It, it did take a bit of time for manufacturers to adopt the standard and build their own implementations, uh, but that original spec was published in 2015. Sweet. So if you're on modern hardware, you got a new cool tool you can check out. When you were in VS Code, I saw something in the bottom that I want to ask about. It said Code GPT. What is that? <laughs> yeah. So, so that's, that's just a uh, VS Code extension. Uh, it's kind of a wrapper around uh, AI models similar to GitHub Copilot. I do use GitHub Copilot probably more often than I do that code GPT uh, extension, but uh, I do still have it installed. <laughs> nice. Is you find that AI has been helpful for your workflow? Oh, absolutely. Like as it's been rolled out? Especially with writing a lot of these functions to make uh, API requests. Uh, a lot of that logic is pretty standard. So using AI models to quickly produce those functions uh, was super, super helpful and a, a huge time saver. Yeah, I love using AI to just give me uh give me eighty percent of the way there. Yeah, I'll, I'll tweak a thing here and there, <laughs> right. but help writing me all help me the code <laughs> from scratch, it's like oh yeah, yeah. I mean, there's some good uh, templates you can kind of use, but 
that's I, I love using AI as like a jumping point for that kind of thing. And it's been kind of wild to see that space develop um, over the past couple of years. I think especially the last year, it's the tools have gotten a lot better, um, especially integrating them with your IDE is pretty sweet. Absolutely. And with the new O1 model, O1 preview, uh, the quality of the code that it produces is leaps and bounds ahead of previous models. So I've seen a huge improvement in efficiency even in the last couple of months. Nice. Yeah, it's a fun space to watch and it's going to keep getting better. I know that Frank um, and Danny had a pretty wild talk about some AI stuff, which I'll, I'll be talking to them about that in a little bit. But yeah, it's, it's a fun space to see. Um, you mentioned a home lab. Do you have like a Plex server or anything like that? Or are you just doing work stuff at the home lab? I do. I do. I have, I have a Plex, a Plex server. server and I have uh, a number of other self-hosted services on a, a couple of different uh, hypervisors as well as on uh, Unraid, which is my OS of choice that I that I like to use. Unraid is what it's called? Unraid. 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 U-N-R-A-I-D. Unraid, yeah. Is that Linux? It is Linux based. It allow it's similar to TrueNAS, I would say. Okay. But allows for virtualization as well as uh, storage array types types of functions. Okay, so you're a nerd, is what you're telling yeah. us. <laughs> yeah, effectively. <laughs> nice. You got a pretty big Plex library. Plex, I'm 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 in love with Plex. I, I mean, do love it's Plex. Super sweet. My library is not as big as I'd like it to be. I'm having a tough time justifying spending time building my Plex library since I have so many streaming subscriptions. I'm really looking for other people that want to use my services so that I can have uh, a reason to invest time in yeah, building them. I wasn't going to say it, but if you mentioned it. <laughs> no. Well, Blake, it's been fantastic getting to know you, getting to chat. Maybe we'll chat at uh, some future conference because actually I got one more question. How are you so well prepared? I was very surprised at how good your talk was. I can tell you put in a lot of time. You're a great presenter. How'd you prepare? I know you got Frank giving you some <laughs> tips here or there, but I appreciate that. Like? Yeah, no, a lot of preparation certainly went into making sure the demo code worked, which we did run into some small caveated <laughs> issues during our demo today, which is unfortunate. But uh, outside of that, I've had some great resources with uh, my coworkers, as you mentioned, Frank and Danny, uh, some opportunities to do some dry runs of the uh, presentation, which helped tremendously. You crushed it, man. I hope Thank you, you man. enjoy the rest of the conference. Enjoy tonight. You earned it. You're done talking. That podcast guy's not going to ask you anymore. You get to just <laughs> kick back, relax, and enjoy the rest of it. So thank you so much, Blake, for joining us. But where can people find you on the World Wide Web? They've enjoyed what you've said. They want to give you a follow on socials and connect and tell you how much they love Redfish. Where can we find you? Yeah, absolutely. The best place to connect with me would certainly be over LinkedIn. Uh, you can find me by just uh, my name, Blake Cherry, and uh, my place of employment, which is a company called West Monroe. Awesome. Well, thank you, Blake. This is the PowerShell Podcast. We're back at it here at PowerShell Saturday NC. I'm Andrew Plot at Andrew Plotek, and I am joined with returning guest, fellow 100 percenter, Danny Stutz in the house. What's up, know. man? Hey, what's, what's up, up, man? Good to see you again. I got some great <laughs> feedback from our last podcast we did together. People were feeling the vibes. Oh, yeah. And we're oh, bringing yeah. vibes again. Here uh, we exactly. are. Exactly. We're back. We're on so, two. <laughs> you've given two presentations today, right? Yeah, two. I was more helping on one, but I would say on the second one for, you know, around end user computer and service desks, that was the one that I kind of like specialized and focused on. And that is the one that blew my mind. So yeah. I'm glad to have you here for that one. So what was that end user computer? What was the title for that? So it was Mastering End User Chaos. Yeah. And it kind of gave up with it just because it's, um, you know, it's more to be around like service tests. It's, it's a little chaotic, you know, working on a service test and just sifting through just a ton of data. And especially as like, you know, service test people are, um, you know, trying to get, get, gain insights from a lot of like their tickets and what ways they can improve. Um, that was kind of the focus of the talk because we had kind of updated our code from when we had last presented at uh, the summit. Um, and it made it more kind of geared towards service desk, but it's it's still kind of more like a broadly applicable, you know, kind of text analysis tool. Data science. Data science. Data here. science. We're, data. Dropping, <laughs> we're dropping big words out here. Big words. Big words. Clustering. Stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> so what? So the idea, I guess, is that you have some kind of feedback. I think in the example you showed today, it was like some kind of uh, employee experience feedback survey. But I guess the other use case you kind of touched on was your service X tickets kind of getting mm -hmm. a, a handle of what exactly are people asking kind of thing. But can you kind of lay out where data science plays into this, what the kind of use case is? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the where data science kind of plays into it is, you know, um, grouping together like language and specifically, you know, sp similar text, right? So the, the concept is all around 
grouping similar text together. It's how, you know, LLMs can find, like, understand what you are telling it, right? When you're chatting with it, it's interpreting what you're saying as, you know, um, what we were talking about in our talk was, you know, embeddings. And so um, I think the data science piece around it comes around how it interprets, you know, that, that data and how to, um, you know, can figure out what you're actually trying to give it and what the inputs are so that it can actually, you know, give you a, a solid response back. So I guess you have an input, which could be a ton of tickets and their subject lines. Mm -hmm, exactly. Right. And then you give that to some AI stuff and determine using the AI I guess uh, what's the phrase that it uses to like determine the words or whatever? Yeah, it's the um, the words. It's it's um, so it's really um, like basically the embeddings is embeddings, what you, the yeah, embeddings the embeddings. So you've, you the way you can think about it is words have a numerical value representation for what they are, right? And it, any different phrase or any you know collection of text has a different numerical value associated with it, and those embeddings is what you know any llm specifically like the one we were using was chat gpt can you use those embeddings to kind of figure out okay what is it what is the text what is it ask what is like the prompt and what is it being what am i being asked basically right that's how i can kind of figure it out it's, it doesn't mean much to us like the, there's just like a bunch of coordinates right of all the dimensions <laughs> that, it, that it can cover um but it, the computers can actually understand, and that's kind of like how we can communicate with like ChatGPT. It's interpreting all of those coordinates, and we basically pull down the quote unquote embeddings from um, you know ChatGPT for like what are the embeddings for like our data set. So I'll iterate through you know our data set and give us a list of all of the numerical values that we can then give it back and say, hey, you know, for for this set of data. Um, kind of what was the you know main theme, and then that way we can cluster the data together. We use those coordinates to, um, you know, those coordinates have values, right? And they're all going to be pretty close to it. Some of them will be close to each other. You know, obviously we can't tell by just looking at the coordinates. That take way too much time, right? Right. Um, but we can, you know, use you know PowerShell and also um, you know other scripting languages to to try and compare those values to to cluster them and show which which values are similar which go, coincides with showing which you know text is similar so that we can get you know a topic or you know get a category for what each of the, the kind of data points represents so if i were to think of it like a one after the other like a step-by-step -step thing so step one you get your input a ton mm -hmm. of tickets whatever it is you get you feed that to ai you get embeddings on all mm -hmm. of those which is some kind of exactly let's be honest some some crazy science stuff okay <laughs> yeah that isn't so easy to process as a human yeah and then you take those and you send them to i think you use like k cluster k means clustering yep yeah k means clustering and then that gives you some coordinates at that point it bas at that point it gives you yeah basically the the clusters of data so you take the points of data like all the the different embeddings and those are all like the different coordinates and when you cluster them together that's when you get um the kind of the values or the the embeddings that are close to each other and you put them in a cluster together because those are the related things to that related cluster whatever that topic is you don't know what the topic is yet but it at least puts the data points where they're closest together and i saw in your presentation then at the end you had sort of like uh, a simple description of what each topic was and what what does that part where it like takes all the stuff and then condenses it down for you yeah so <laughs> that part is basically you're saying for these, you know, for, for our example, we use, you know, five of the top most representative items in a cluster. So after we get it grouped together, it's all clustered, right? Now we want to understand, okay, what's the actual, like, topic? Like, because at this point, it's just numbers, right? It's a right. numbers and the indexes in our CSV of, like, oh, like, here, these values, this line 1000 is related to this cluster. That doesn't mean anything to us. It's just a number, right? But once we ask it, hey here was our input data here's like the indexes for it here's the most representative items give us the topic or main theme of these top five items because they they're clearly like the most representative items for that cluster and that should give us a really solid idea of like what are those what's that text talking about or what is that data talking about and in doing that, there's a few different things you can tweak. I think one thing you mentioned was the temperature, kind of how <laughs> much you want to let the AI extrapolate on things. Um, in your testing and kind of going through this at work for your use case of, I think, the end user experience stuff, how much tweaking did you have to do 
to get it usable or was it pretty good right out the gate it was pretty good right out of the gate we so like temperature is a really good example i think we tuned it i forget if we tuned it up or not like uh higher i think we just stuck with like the standard like temperature the standards like it's halfway in between of being like 100 percent is the most creative it can be <laughs> you know <laughs> as, as as frank would like to say as stowed as it could possibly be yes, exactly. and then zero is just completely boring like just zero zero creativity takes it very literally so there's a nice fine middle ground where it can be you know a little creative but also you know stay a little grounded in, in its responses so there's a lot of fine tuning you can do to it to give you kind of a different response um of like how how it thinks about or interprets things i think that's a really interesting kind of thing with um open ai and just albums in general is that kind of fine tuning of like here's kind of how i want the response to be and um yeah stuff like that sweet yeah it's kind of wild to see this kind of stuff available in powershell i think you leverage .net a lot yeah .net was used a lot mainly for the the clustering pieces so the k-means clustering pieces where the .net packages come in um because that part is it's not like we were talking about in our talk it's not like a readily like available thing to do those kind of data sciencey things inside of powershell so yeah. leveraging some kind of built-in you know .net frameworks like uh, the we use like the accord machine learning um package or dot net package that is um that's more for yeah like the some of the more data sciencey stuff and yeah and then i think the other stuff you just can use api calls yeah yeah everything else is mostly api calls there's so we use some like you know cool modules in there like the secrets management module which yeah. we talk a lot about but um yeah otherwise it's just straight api calls right it's just piping in data from you know our csvs into into an api call and just doing it in a scripted fashion where it's not not like you have to make one api call for for every right. single thing yeah where did this idea come from like where did you come across like oh we should use ai and data science for this well, I think where it started was, I mean, Frank had brought it up, you know, Frank Lesniak. Oh, we know, um, we know Frank. We know Frank. We know Frank. I think he's a, he's regular on this podcast, but, um, he, had, he had helped with, uh, one of our employee surveys, um, f or helping, you know, to kind of go sort through the comments and categorize, you know, employee survey comments from like our company wide survey and doing this by hand is, I mean, as you, as we kind of talked about, it's <laughs> there's people write paragraphs. Oh yeah. Paragraphs you get thousands of employees too it's not like 15 yeah it's like, oh, it's no. like, it's, yeah it's not like 10 or 15 people right it's like a couple hun few hundred people right? yeah and they, they have 20 questions that they have answered and they there's a bunch of responses that they have so um that's kind of where the idea stemmed from was to help sift through that data in an automated fashion to, to yeah. kind of be able to analyze that data and pull themes out of of that data it's kind of where it all stemmed from but we kind of delved into you know there's a lot of different use cases for this right anything where you're analyzing free text data or maybe you're trying to group together some similar text data right like it's 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 applicable in that way too. yeah and i saw in your presentation you had some tickets that were in spanish and different languages yeah. <laughs> oh yeah exactly and the ai just handles that yeah, so it handles it, right? Because I mean, think, I mean, words are words are numbers. <laughs> numbers are words, right? Yes, if you say so, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, that's the kind of way to think about it. Is like, I mean, like the embedding is like they have a numerical representation, right? Same with words. Like all words have a numerical representation in some way, shape, or form, and it so it can interpret what yeah, it can basically give you values for you know whatever language it's in it groups together similar um similar text right and they recognize oh it's it's in spanish so it kind of group those together um it'd be interesting to see though if it actually can get the topic out of it um in, in terms of like um grouping together like if there's for example like someone responded in spanish to the same question and someone responded the same question in english yeah i mean it should be able to you know group those together because it's i mean it's it's language agnostic in in a way because it's it's numbers it's not necessarily because i mean it could output the numbers in any any numbers are numbers, num numbers, are numbers and it could output it in really any language right because i mean you take a certain numerical value and convert it to any language you want right it's so. a lot of bing bang boom exactly <laughs> but after doing this do you understand why ai positions are so high paid because oh dude, yeah hearing some of the tools oh, yeah. you were using i was like wow i really would have to invest a lot of time to get my mind to be able to understand and communicate with others and, and that kind of thing like there's a lot to it a lot of math oh, a yeah. lot of 
thinking kind of abstractly to even understand mm -hmm. what's kind of going on. Exactly. No, it totally makes sense, especially, yeah, any, like, really advanced, like, machine learning positions, engineers. I've met some incredibly smart machine learning engineers, and it's like, yeah, I can get why you guys are paid so much yeah. and why it's become such a huge thing, because it's, it's such a complex thing that doesn't necessarily come, like, innately. Like, it's not easy to understand, right? It's So it's kind of a new kind of cutting-edge tech that we're, that we're working on and that, that, you know, data engineers and ML engineers are working on. Um, and it makes sense why it's become such a big field and also why those positions are so highly sought out is because there's not a lot of people that can think at that level from abstraction, doing the math, like having that make sense, right? Like it's, it's crazy what it, what it's going to come to. What were some of the challenges, like as you went through your learning journey to kind of make this happen and put together the presentation and all that, what were some of the biggest things for you to wrap your mind around? I think the biggest things for me like to, to understand or to wrap my head around was the kind of clustering of data. Um, that was kind of like the, the, the part that kind of threw me for a loop of like how is it actually you know calculating what's closest to each other obviously it's just numbers but understanding how it picked which points to put into which cluster you know say stuff was equal distance to uh, you know two different clusters it's like how does it figure that out like how does it automatically how does it figure it out that was kind of one of the biggest learning curves i think for me but it was just super interesting like even understanding how like llms work right like a lot of us just see you know chat gpt i talk to it it's magic. And it's, it's magic i just talk to it right like and it just responds and it knows what i'm saying it's crazy um but seeing like how it works like under the covers it just helps you understand it to such a deeper level to like understand like how it's thinking how it's operating and so you can kind of adjust how you you know prompt it and how you you know talk to the the chatbots it's it's definitely you know kind of opened my eyes to it and i think just understanding how it understands and interprets you know just free text data it was it was a big kind of like learning curve for me but it was really really interesting to figure out and where did the dimensions because I, I think i remember you guys saying there's like three thousand dimensions three thousand seventy two in chat gpt up with that <laughs> Linear algebra. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that, that, I skipped that class. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, <laughs> honestly, you, you did miss much. But it's yeah, it's all vector. Vector algebra. And it's there's honestly like to that to that degree, I haven't even like gotten even into that like how how is that working like how is that math working but like i mean the one one thing we mentioned in our slides is the, the euclidean distance which is like a I mean, you're like, dropping that word you get erased some guy they, yeah you, I, well i remember presenting uh getting prep with frank and he mentioned uh euclidean distance and i was like oh, i haven't heard that term <laughs> in years I, back at school at iowa i, I took it had to take a class for computer science and it was like i was well, i heard that term and i was like Oh, I remember this. Is, yeah, it's calculating the distance between vectors, and I was like, "Oh, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right." There and is a this, use case for there it. There is. Hey. A, this, that's where this is actually applicable. Okay, now this is all making sense as opposed to just giant matrices and vectors of everything. So, yeah, it's it's a crazy field. It is cool to see how math and things like that can tie in. I mean, I know in school people would always talk about, "Oh, when are you actually going to ever use this outside of multiplication and division?" Apparently, uh, if you're in the PowerShell or data <laughs> science space, you're using it. You can use it. <laughs> you can use it yeah especially in the data science place i mean, I mean space it's i mean it's all, pretty much all like statistics it's just a lot of statistics like some really advanced statistics all the way down i mean linear algebra like yeah it's it's cool to find like actually like applicable use cases for like some of those more advanced mathematics because yeah. it's like i don't use calculus every day but like <laughs> at all but like i mean there's sometimes like, maybe maybe i could but you could you know and wow. I guess for this, you, you did, you did. Yeah, exactly. Bit. For this, for this presentation, we, yeah, we had to, <laughs> I had to kind of refresh my memory. I'm like, what is this actually? <laughs> what was this term actually? And how does this work? hundred percent. Nice. Well, it was very exciting to see. I'll, I'll tell you that much. My mind, I was, I mean, you saw me, I was locked in. <laughs> <laughs> you were locked in. You were locked in front row. Taking front notes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Front row and center. Oh, front and row center. center. And know. center. Exactly, exactly. I was there for it, man. But oh, yeah. Outside of the fancy data sciencey stuff, are you using AI in your kind of daily work at all or for your personal workflows? Yeah, I mean, pretty much like, I mean, yeah, I think a lot of our, our company and we have kind of our own like internal, you know, chat GPT bot that we use for, I mean, you know, securing like client data for asking like specific questions around it. So, I mean, that's a big part of my workflow now is using kind of those tools to help me just do things faster, right? Like, it's like, I'm not, I don't want to sit there all day some days and just like type out documentation. Like, I mean, making documentation, right? That's a huge, every, every, 
programmer's worst nightmare. It's just making documentation as critical as it is. But I always find it funny. It's like we as programmers are like, man, who who wrote this? Why didn't they make any documentation? But yeah. when it comes time for us to do it, we're like, eh, maybe I can wait. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, going back to your like kind of original question, I mean, I've also been using copilot a lot and github copilot um built into vs code and that's like a really beneficial tool for um writing you know powershell i've also used it to like write like terraform as well um for like building infrastructure and it's just like natively integrated into vs code and it's helped a ton with just like um you know programming and getting things done quickly um because it can think through like and can take a look at your code of like okay i know kind of what you're trying to do and it can make a recommendation of like here's what i think you're about to do and then you can just hit tab it does everything for you it saves you like i mean five ten minutes depending on how complex the argument is right and it, generally speaking it gets a pretty it's pretty accurate like especially copilot i've had a lot more success with copilot versus like even chat gpt um just because copilot goes to like public repositories and pulls from there on like what people have done in the past um, versus, you know, trying to generate something kind of net new. Um, it's definitely kind of a game changer, I, I'd say for sure, um, especially in the tech, tech space. Oh my gosh, yes. I, it, I've been using Copilot and sometimes I will be um, like running a internal uh, PowerShell group at work and I'll be coding something and kind of showing some things and I'll be like, oh crap, what did I name that variable? <laughs> oh crap, what did I want to write? And instead of scrolling up, I just press, uh, I think it's tab or yeah, whatever, tab. and it just, boom, it finishes boom. it for me. That's exactly what I wanted to do. Now, not like, always, but like a good majority of the time, it, it, it helps my forgetfulness. Oh, 100%. Or if you're just like, well, yeah, what did I name that variable? <laughs> like, right? where, where am I in this loop? Like, it was like, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty sweet. It. Yeah. On the topic of PowerShell groups at work, I hear you're involved in the one at your work. Oh, yeah, for sure. It's a monthly meetup kind of thing, or what, yeah. what do you got going on over yeah. there? Yeah, so it's a monthly meeting, and we just got, like, a new team member who's helping out with Run It 2 now. But it's, I mean, we've been doing it for, two, I mean, years. I mean, at this point, and kind of took over the reins from Frank, and um, at least for just, you know, scheduling and get it, getting on the books. But, you know, we were, like, one of the major interest groups, like, at our company that, like, meets on a regular basis. A lot of our, you know, interest groups, sometimes, you know, obviously client work comes first, but... For us, we have a pretty regular cadence every month of, you know, figuring out what's new, what new topics are kind of coming out. Has anyone written any new cool scripts that are like super useful, right? Like, I mean, we write scripts to help each other out, um, to help, you know, make our work a lot easier to do, make things standard. I mean, that's a big thing is just like, you know, especially junior resources who are just kind of getting spun up. Like they're not sure, sure how to do a lot of these things, right? And if you can kind of give them a, a boilerplate, you know, here's a script to, to do this in the bulk, it saves them a ton of time, saves you a ton of time and also make sure it gets done right, right? Yep. So and opens their eyes to PowerShell. Maybe they invest yeah, a little more time getting exactly. up to date, considering it for future use cases. Yeah, I run a security one, um, which is monthly, and then I, every two weeks we do a PowerShell one. And it's been really cool. I think I've been doing the PowerShell one for like a couple of years now. That's sweet. And uh, it's nice because now if we have a problem that we want to solve that's maybe not business critical, maybe kind of a nice to have kind of deal. Well, we have a group of people who are all familiar with GitHub and collaborating and PRs. So it's like we can take a big chunk of work, split it out between a bunch of people and do some yeah. really cool things that we – I mean, I personally don't have the time to, to do yeah, something yeah. so able to do. So it's pretty cool in that regard, too. And also kind of building people up, like you were saying. So if you're listening out there, I highly recommend it. If you're listening to a podcast like this, you're 20 minutes in, you're a hardcore power sheller, <laughs> all right? You've got that passion. Share it with others. Use it as an opportunity to teach, to learn what, what you will be teaching potentially and, and learn from others and sort of open up those doors to make it a collaborative workplace. Um, because it's just so much better. I, I've been in the spot where everyone has to kind of not ask questions and act like they mm, know it all. Exactly. But when you open up those doors of like, hey, you know, I mean, I, I'm the one leading the group and I didn't even know that, you know, it kind of mm -hmm. opens up like, okay, that's fine. I didn't know that either, you know? Yeah. No, that's awesome. When everyone can kind of level set, kind of bring themselves to earth of like, yeah, I, I didn't know that. And people bring such, it, it's great when you get new people involved because they bring such fresh perspectives on like something we've been doing for years, right? Like we have kind of our, our way of thinking. We know, we know about it. We know about PowerShell. We know about like certain topics, but when you bring in, you know, new people who have never even seen this or understand what it's used for, you get really cool and interesting perspectives. And that's, I think the, the, the beautiful part of having a lot of different people involved is it's just a bunch of different perspectives and cool ways to solve it, you know, different problems. And there's, yeah. 
Share a message with the people, man. They're vibing right now. They're, they're digging it. Share a message. Can you inspire the masses right now? On the fly? Yeah. yeah. Honestly, take the time to help out other people. You know, no matter what, like, like you were saying, you don't want to make people feel dumb, right? Like, you don't want to have an environment where people are scared to ask questions. Questions. People, I hear the term, you know, stupid questions a lot. They're really, there's no stupid questions. Like, there really aren't. You, if you never ask a question, you're never going to get it out there. You're never going to get an answer that you want or you maybe is, is reliable. So be open to, to helping other people out and to, be, to take the time to, to answer someone's questions. Even if it's just a quick ping or if it's a quick email or something like that that you got to respond to, you know, that little five minutes might save someone 10 hours, eight hours, right? And that's kind of like the way you got to look at it is like, am I going to let this person, you know, struggle like by themselves? No, like you, you got to help people out. So, I mean, like you're saying, you know, get a group together you know to for like at least like a powershell interest group or even just any interest group in general and just sit down and have people you can talk freely with and and you know freely speak your ideas and you you'll succeed much more than you know just working on your own right personally for me i would much rather work with a noob who asks questions and is honest mm -hmm. than like someone with some skills but never asks the questions never communicates with others like it's kind of a dangerous combo you got to be able to be honest and hopefully your workplace has like a culture that that allows that absolutely absolutely um I, yeah i think we have a very you know at, at least at my work and the people we work with i think it's a lot of you know people are always open to asking questions and how how what's the best way to do things right and like what best way to approach things and i think that's what generates the best ideas and makes you us as a company more successful just at, and as people more successful like if you can ask and challenge ideas and challenge norms that can lead you to something you might have never discovered if you everyone stayed on the same path right i'm inspired man you got me you <laughs> convinced I you? me Did i get you, you five minutes of wisdom me, like <laughs> awesome no, well yeah. People have been enjoying what you've been saying, man. Where can we find you on social media, on the World Wide Web? We want to connect. We want to get more of that D Stutz. Yeah, D Stutz. <laughs> the one and only. Uh, you can hit, find me on Twitter. Um, I, Danny underscore Stutz. Danny underscore Stutz. Yep, that's my Twitter. That's and Stutz with the Z at the end. The Stutz was the Z at the end. S-T-U-T-Z. He yeah. saved the best for last. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You can also add me on LinkedIn. You can find me, Danny Stutz. Um, West think, Monroe. Uh, West Monroe, yep. Yes, sir. I'm interviewing you look your it whole up. crew. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly, exactly. You can find me there. Um, also, you can follow me on my GitHub, Dan Stutz. Um, if you're trying to look at some of the public projects that I yeah. contribute to. but You know what? You links know? are going to be in the show notes to everything exactly. that is shareable exactly. from this conference from today. I'll put your social links in there as well. And to tie things a little bit together, because I'll be talking to Frank here shortly, but I want to appreciate your shoe game. We sort of have matching shoes on. I know. I did notice that actually last night. You also, you got the sushi socks on. Oh, yeah. You, yeah. And we you talked about sushi in mm -hmm. the Blake Cherry interview. <laughs> so, we're rocking. And we it. got Frank with the limited edition Jordans. Jordans. Awesome, right. man. Well, thank right. you so much for joining. Returning. Oh, yeah. I hope Returning guests. At the, at the conference in the future. Absolutely. We can run this back. Summer 2025. Y'all better be there. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. Awesome. Thanks, awesome. everybody. Thanks, Juan. Thanks for listening to the PowerShell Podcast. The PowerShell Podcast is a PDQ production, making device management simple, secure, and pretty damn quick.